morning, everyone. If I can have your attention, please. Uh, thank you for coming here this morning. Uh, welcome to Brookings, India. My name is uh, Prabhat Jayashankar. I'm fellow for foreign policy here. Uh, I know many of you already, but uh, welcome. Uh, it's very nice to meet those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting already. Um, we are here to discuss uh, three years of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's foreign policy. Um, and this is actually an event I've been wanting to do for some time. Uh, I'll, I'll explain the rationale a little bit in a second. But we have uh, three really distinguished panelists, uh, all authors uh, of, of uh, recent books on uh, Modi and his uh, challenges, for mostly foreign policy, but also domestic, and I think we'll be here that territory soon as well. Um, but um, I do want to, uh, I do want to make this more of a discussion. I want to involve all of you. Um, but before we do all of that, before I introduce the panelists uh, in just a second, I thought it would be worthwhile to just review the last few years because, boy, it's been a really hectic, busy last year, last few years. Uh, so just a few things that have happened. Um, um, sorry, can we go back one? Yep. So I mean, just uh, take a, a look at some, some of the things that have happened in the last few years, uh, and it just so we are, we're all on the same page. I mean, I think it's quite interesting that one of the first acts of uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, at, at all was, uh, in fact, an act of foreign policy when he invited leaders from uh, the other South Asian countries and Mauritius to, uh, to uh, Delhi for his inauguration. Uh, in particular, we've seen some very uh, important developments in relation to Bangladesh. Uh, and for Sri Lanka as well, the, the photograph is from Prime Minister's recent uh, uh, The other sort of unexpected uh, thing, or something that surprised a lot of people, was his uh, very aggressive outreach to the United States. Um, on the left, you see uh, his event at Madison Square Garden in New York on his first visit. Uh, I happened to be there at the time, and it was really quite, quite something. I don't think New York had seen a political event like that for some time. Uh, and then, of course, he invited a few months later President Barack Obama to for publicly, the first time a U.S. president had come for that. Uh, and then subsequently, he, he made a speech at the joint meeting of, of uh, the U.S. Congress. Um, a few other relationships that have gone, um, uh, have progressed, or seem, uh, which the Prime Minister seems to have invested quite a lot of his capital, one with Japan, uh, with particularly in the annual summit he has been having with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, the two had a relationship before Modi was elected and, uh, and when Abe was out of power, in fact. Uh, and they've uh, they've seemed to have built on that. The other one, and we'll be hearing a lot more about this in the coming days and weeks, is uh, the relationship with Israel. I believe Dr. Chotawale has just come back from Israel, so we can ask him a little bit about uh, developments there. The India-Africa summit is a was another major uh, event that was held here, and we've uh, on top of that we've had the African Development Bank meeting in Gandhinagar of all places uh, that's ongoing. Uh, but there's been a sort of different form of outreach to places like Africa and Latin America, the South Pacific, and others. Um, this is from Prime Minister Modi's visit to uh, Mauritius, uh, where I think he gave a very important speech that laid out, in some ways, uh, India's approach to the Indian Ocean. Uh, and I think if there's been one, at least change, if, you, if, if change is a measure of anything, uh, I think uh, the relationship with the Gulf Arab states, particularly Saudi Arabia, that's the picture image on the left, uh, and the UAE uh, uh, have been uh, of particular significance. I think we've seen perhaps the most change in the last two, three years in that domain. Um, uh, on the other hand, other relationships seem to have uh, become more transactional. Um, and two of them are, uh, you know, one with, with Russia. There's been some concern about uh, the future of that relationship, although there has been an annual summit with uh, President Putin. Uh, the other is uh, Iran, and that's the that's image of uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi with uh, President Ghani of Afghanistan and uh, Rouhani of Iran uh, when, when they uh, agreed to a tripartite agreement. Uh, a few, there have been a few other ups and downs. Uh, this is, uh, I think, Nepal. A lot of people would point to Nepal as being one example of that. We saw, on the one hand, a great deal of Indian effort go into uh, aid and humanitarian assistance in the aftermath of the Nepal earthquake. Uh, on the other hand, we had some uh, political uh, uh, downs as well, uh, including uh, a supposed blockade uh, on Nepal uh, in, in, in the context of the Madeshi protests uh, there. Um, another thing, this, this now seems like a very long time ago, but Pre President Xi Jinping uh, coming uh, to Gandhinagar and, uh, in, in September of 2015, uh, and sitting on a dula with, with the Prime Minister. Uh, of course, uh, India-China relations have taken on a great deal of complexity, and again, I hope we can talk about that. 
And finally, of course, uh, who can forget uh, relations with Pakistan, which, which seem to be always in the news. Uh, we had, on the one hand, uh, Prime Minister Modi going to Lahore, uh, the first time an Indian Prime Minister had gone in many years uh, to Pakistan. On the other hand, we had the surgical strikes, and we've had a certain degree of acrimony in that relationship. Um, so to discuss uh, some of these developments, and so I'll put them in context, we have three uh, authors. Uh, their books are all uh, here. You can s uh, see them. Uh, to my immediate left is uh, Dr. Vijay Chotawale from the BJP. Uh, Dr. Sriram Cholia from, uh, is to my right, who is uh, the dean of the uh, Jindal School of International Studies at uh, uh, Jindal Global University. And then uh, to my far left is uh, uh, Raji Kumar, who is an economist, but has a very distinguished career that has straddled both national security and uh, economic policy as well. Uh, and uh, I'm, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with their with the biographies. Um, so without further ado, I want to start off by asking each of our panelists a question, uh, which is, let me start with Dr. Chhatavale. Could you, what would you say are the key features of the Modi doctrine, as in your book and, and uh, uh, in, in, in your view? Thanks, Dhruv, for inviting me here. And thank you, everyone, for coming. I would say four or five uh, highlights of uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, doctrine, even though doctrine is, I would say, in pro uh, work in progress. It's not something which is iron cast, uh, and no doctrine, no foreign policy can be in iron cast mode. Uh, some of them have been discussed uh, by others also. I would say that first of all, what we have done is uh, trying to manage the conflicting interest in favor of India. Uh, by the way, India first policy, you can say, extension. Uh, is we have good relations with, with now Saudi Arabia, Iran, and also UAE, and now Prime Minister will be visiting Israel next uh, month or so. Uh, second is that for the first time after long, we are seeing a very tight integration between India's foreign policy and the domestic policy and uh, it can be make in India, digital India and also social campaigns of Prime Minister Modi like uh, Clean India, Namami Gange, the toilet building and I, we see that uh, our foreign policy machinery is actively working not only to propagate uh, for this but actu uh, actually doing lot of work in the involvement both in the social sector and the investment sector. Third is of course uh, he has done uh, what I call it as uh, reaching the unreached and uh, there are series of uh, nations, important nations like Canada, UAE, I can go on telling you the list where Indian uh, Prime Minister has not visited not only few years but few decades uh, and uh, Prime Minister Modi has visited almost all of them and only one which is prominently remaining Israel, so first time that visit will happen in the first week of July. Uh, its connect with the diaspora is a very important uh, part and uh, he wants to make uh, Indian diaspora globally present as a part of his uh, development agenda and uh, he has successfully driven that message to almost all major countries and uh, in addition to what India is doing, I, because I have attended most of these diaspora events uh, of Prime Minister Modi, I can tell you very confidently that these events have raised the stature of Indian diaspora in their own country and in many cases it has also been uh, recognized as a political force to reckon with, especially in the countries like Canada, in UK, uh, it, we can see it very, uh, very distinctly. And the last but not least is that uh, with the surgical strike which Ruha has already mentioned, uh, we have overcome what we call is as, as a strategic restraint where our not uh, our inability to do, s to do certain things the way we wish was converted into virtue of strategic restraint and we have overcome it and we have shown by surgical strikes and also you must have seen the video uh, two three days back uh, that uh, we are capable to do certain things even by across the border if our national security interests are challenged. So I guess these are broadly five or six distinct features of uh, Prime Minister Modi's foreign policy.
Thank you. Um, let me ask uh, the same question to Sriram. What, what do you think are the main tenets of the Thank you, Dhruva. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, I will be a little more abstract. Uh, we did cover a lot of specific uh, areas uh, where there have been drastic improvements in the way we approach the world. Uh, but I am going to be a little more generic here. Uh, then maybe sometime later for the specifics. I think the biggest change or the biggest um, um, deliverable of uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, hyperactive diplomacy has been um, setting our goals and ambitions much, much higher than any previous Indian government has done since Jawaharlal Nehru. The ambition is clearly stated, and that's part of the doctrine uh, that I've described in my book. The ambition is for India to become a leading power, official, stated goal. You know, for a doctrine, it's very important to have a um, well-defined objective and an end goal. And uh, India has, if you know the history of Indian foreign policy, um, India has been very diffident. The strategic restraint uh, BJP mentioned has, is part of this diffidence, overall diffidence. And, um, Amitabh Bhattu wrote a very interesting book, uh, edited an interesting book in 2012-13, which was actually the worst times for India's uh, foreign policy, in my view, um, saying, and the title was India Reluctant Superpower. We've always been ambivalent about power, acquiring power, wielding power, and expanding our influence. We've always been somewhat cagey about these notions because of the heritage of being a decolonized nation and of being, you know, an underdog, a downtrodden in world affairs who's always challenging those who are the powers that be and the status quo. But I think Modi is far more comfortable, both in domestic politics, where he has unparalleled sway and popularity in his country, and at the international level, where he believes that our time has come. So the first thing is that we are much, much more ambitious. And um, there is a quote that I often take from one of his famous speeches. I think it was in uh, uh, Dubai, where he says, uh, and I'll translate it later uh, in a moment, These days, we have a government in Delhi that is omnipresent all the time on the world stage. This is what is basically the big transformation that has happened in the last three years where Vijayji mentioned reaching out to the farthest corners of the globe, reaching out to some of the nondescript players, Pacific Island nations, um, Indian Ocean Island nations, um, Dhruva showed you images of in, 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 in Mauritius, um, offering India as a provider of uh, net provider of security and of prosperity to all these smaller players. Historically, we've had this notion that we are a leader of the developing world, but I don't think anyone has really executed it the way Modi is doing it. Just take, for example, the South Asian satellite, which was just launched last month, uh, sorry, earlier this month. It's a matter of pride for us that we have invested, we have put our money where our mouth is, uh, and uh, we are generating public goods for the wider region. Um, and not just our own neighborhood, um, the engagement with Africa, as mentioned, has really taken on a higher level of tempo. And um, again, even with uh, Latin America, uh, you, some of you know, I, distinguished diplomats in the audience know, uh, our leaders had been incommunicado with Latin America for decades. And uh, within a year, all of that changed in uh, 2014-15. Um, so all these factors, I think, uh, are, are part of this larger ambition. And the drive to, uh, you know, to be recognized and to be seen as important and to be playing a role and to be a, uh, 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 a provider of solutions to international problems. I think that's the big change of Modi. What he has done is, we are not only looking out for ourselves. Some of you may have read a book by Lance Price, which, which came out very early, called Modi Effect. And there's a very telling uh, paragraph there in that book, where Lance Price, the uh, Prime Minister, I think he was not yet elected at the time. Uh, as Prime Minister, he was still the Chief Minister of Gujarat uh, in early 2014, where he was saying, you know, all this while we have been going out to the world and saying, and trying to communicate what India wants. And he said, I want to change that. I want to understand what does the world want from India. 
and I'm ready to give it. So from a recipient and a taker to a giver, I think that's a big attitudinal and mindset transformation that Modi has done to our foreign policy establishment. Uh, the bureaucracy has remained the same. The mandarins who've been executing have remained the same. Um, what has changed is the political leadership and the political will at the top. So I think if you look at Modi, Modi's impact, it is to give a political impetus to a foreign policy from the highest level, something we have not seen, I think, since the 1950s or 60s, which was a different era altogether. We are much more powerful now and inching our way upwards. So overall, I would say that the biggest change, and that let me add the last point, which is um, preparing the public, the domestic audiences. Vijay uh, uh, again mentioned that the connection between domestic and international, because he's such an effective communicator, um, the public diplomacy has been phenomenal. Even though we are underinvested and under-resourced in our own ministry for public diplomacy, our prime minister is what I call a diplomatic chief. And um, his outreach has been phenomenal. I've, in my book, I've spoken about not just G2G as in government to government or government to business, which of course been there for the last 20, 25 years, but government to people within <coughs> India and to the people of the world. So there is that extra edge he brings in terms of soft power, in terms of outreach, in terms of communication. So in a way, I think his goal is this omnipresence and to make India to be felt, not just seen, to be felt in every part of the world, in the minds and hearts of people. So all these, um, um, if you look at his cultural diplomacy, the diaspora which Vijayji mentioned, all these are part of this uh, thrust for India to be felt um, as a player to be reckoned with. So I think in retrospect, three years, uh, there's so many you know, specific incidents we could go into, but this is the big takeaway that we are on the uh, on a different trajectory, a different pathway last three years. And um, Rajiv is here, and he's of course, uh, uh, maybe uh, refer more to the economic uh, diplomacy, but even there, I think uh, the numbers, the figures um, show that we have outperformed all previous regimes in the last three years in terms of FDI, in terms of uh, relative improvement in ease of doing business and all these things, in terms of you know bringing the world to India uh, in a much bigger way, saying that we are open. Prime Minister, we are the most open developing, uh, fastest growing developing country in the world. And uh, despite our numerous hurdles and red tape and you know bureaucratic uh, hassles, I think he has been able to uh, sell the India story far better. So I think all these, if you look at it, in comprehensive picture, um, we are far better off, far stronger, and far more proactive today than we were until 2014. And I see the trajectory keep continuing to go forward. New relationships that Ruba mentioned with Israel, um, uh, which are now coming out with the open. Uh, Japan, of course, definitely it was there even before 2014. But there seems to be a kind of a multiplication of efforts. Last, I want to leave you with a vignette uh, before passing on. Just recently, on the 15th of May, and you would have all followed the proceedings. It was electrifying. Um, I was on Republic TV analyzing what was going on, and uh, Arnab Goswami got a direct uh, interview with um, Harish Salve uh, within a few minutes of the completion of his, uh, you know, stellar uh, um, defense of India's position on Kulbush and Jadav. And um, so Arnab asked him, uh, "What has changed?" Uh, how come we are now going more and more international on these issues? Earlier, we used to be defensive with Pakistan, not wanting to internationalize, saying that it's all bilateral. What has happened? What has changed? And um, uh, Hari Salve says, you know, we must congratulate um, um, the Ministry of External Affairs and Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister. And he said, they have acted with, I use the phrase, I'm repeating verbatim, I quote, they have acted with alacrity and dispatch. That's Harish Salve in his clipped, you know, English accent saying alacrity and dispatch. And uh, I think that captures this, this moment, this, this, uh, this era, where Indian interests are at stake, where global interests are at stake. We are not only looking out for ourselves, but global interests. When these are at stake, we act with alacrity and dispatch, speed, um, consciousness about what are our own strengths, uh, knowing our own capabilities. I think we had not really known our own mojos before. So he knows what are our mojos, and then we project those onto the world stage. So if you take all these in a comprehensive way, that is uh, the doctrine that I see. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kumar, uh, you have, uh, um, 
you know, your book is, um, uh, I would say, much more measure, uh, much more guarded in its uh, um, its optimism about uh, the developments under the new uh, the new uh, yeah. government. Um, what are some of the things that you think are the defining features uh, of this uh, this prime minister's uh, external engagements? Thanks, Ro, and thanks to everybody who's here. Um, I wish I could be as effu effusive, uh, and uh, so let me. Uh, but you know, but but before I start, I must say that uh, my overall stance is that the three years have been very positive for India's engagement with the world, and rather different. Uh, but what the drivers are of this, I think we need to analyze them a bit dispassionately. And in my book, I actually I make the maybe the unwarranted statement that uh, what drives Mr. Modi, uh, Modi's hyperactivity on the international scene, that he's become a super foreign minister, is that he has achieved what he wanted to achieve in the domestic uh, say stage, and he wants now to become a global statesman and want to mark, make a mark there. So in, in with a lot of other things. And there's nothing wrong with it. There is personal ambition which drives Mr. Modi's foreign policy agenda. And that's why you see this sort of activities and you see this, you know, thing that, that you know, Vijay mentioned and Shalaya um, mentioned, which is that, you know, the reaching the unreached and doing, you know, sort of things that have not been done, etc. And here, I think uh, the first thing that I wanted to say and I'll come to is that to begin with, uh, the two things which I thought were very uh, remarkable about Mr. Modi was one, that he was completely unideological about his foreign policy and, and, and made foreign policy an uh, instrument of serving the national interest. And that was very clearly defined in his mind and I think he had articulated that, which was very different again from the past. There was no, there was no ideological baggage that he would carry as long, you know, whatever, I mean, more like Deng Xiaoping almost, it didn't matter what the color of the cat was as long as, and therefore, and I'll come back to that. And the second one, which, uh, which is, uh, is that he began his foreign policy stint as it were in good faith uh, and then suddenly realized that the world is not such a good place out there. You know, and, and, and I think the two things that were you know, remarkable examples of this was his invitation to Nawaz Sharif for his own, uh, you know, for his own um, investiture you know, for his sort of, and his uh, treatment of uh, President Xi, you know, the picture that you showed. And in both cases, after Nawaz Sharif came and went, he realized that Rawal Pindi didn't like it one bit, and Nawaz was completely constrained, and you know, and the whole tenor, and that remark in by the way that included his flying visit to the granddaughter's, you know, wedding and so on. But he then realized that you know, I, the real, the deep state is what matters, and deep state he had no, you know, he had no interaction with, and suddenly the whole thing in some sense has come apart. And same thing with President Xi, while he was on the swing, uh, the, the the PLA was in uh, Aksai Chin. You know, and that's what happened. And so so it's, it's, it, in some sense, he's learned rather rudely on the job. And, uh, but he's a very good learner. And he's a very good learner. And so therefore, I think he has learned a lot. The third point that I do want to make is that, for me, a bit unfortunately, and this is with all due respect to the influence that Vijay has on foreign policy at the moment, India's foreign policy continues to be driven by the South Bloc. And the mandarins of the South Bloc, your father included, uh, where, which is where that, uh, you know, which is where, you know, it was he who first articulated what, uh, and I forget the sorry, his first name, but Sri Ram. Sri Ram. What Sri Ram said, you know, that um, it was, it was uh, the foreign secretary who first articulated that India will no more be a balancing power, but will be a leading power. And then that sort of has continued. But, you know, but, and, and why am I saying that is that I think to that extent, and the example that I want to give is the South Asia policy, this is one of the principal objectives of President, you know, Prime Minister Modi's to get the neighborhood, as it were, going and get the neighbor, India's position in the neighborhood, you know, sort of, you know, solidify and get South Asia moving forward. Uh, Nepal's, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of roller coaster ride that we've had in Nepal, after the amazing visits that he had, two visits, and then the sort of failure that we've had in, in Indo-Nepal relations, to the extent that we've now had Nepal signing MOUs with China, attending OBOR, and getting the, I think, getting also, you know, ready for strategic dialogue with them. I think is, 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 to me, is, is evidence of the fact that despite his hyperactivity and his great, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, intellectual prowess, if you like, because I've you know, read about the man, he has allowed foreign policy to be driven by the, by the Indian diplomacy. And with their own, uh, in some sense, uh, sometimes I find non-strategic understanding of the international, and there your father is not included. 
so you know so <laughs> but you know the four four uh, the four things that i thought were his uh, hallmark were his neighborhood policy the indo us relations where he has made a change where he's made in you know, all this uh, to begin with the indo china policy where he went out of his way as it were to you know become friends with china and finally the diaspora i think those are the four and i think the way uh, the sort of a little more abstractly is that uh, he has uh, he has realized that we are in the world of what is called variable geometry uh, where what matters is that not in which camp you are etc but you have to engage with the largest number of players globally uh, to be to be there and that's what explains 33 countries in 18 months that was his record and then so on you know and then and, and, and the, uh, the other one i think is is very clear that he is now i think much more than before realized that india can do as much as india's hard power will allow and so therefore economics is the key to foreign policy and therefore to that extent he slowed down on some of those engagements and india cannot offer to the world whatever the world wants without india actually getting on with its own uh, you know internal game and the internal economy and i think that is where he is focusing a lot more on the internal reforms and you've seen the change in that and if you see between 15 and 17 if you divide the period in two two halves of 18 months you will see the shift in mr modi's attention uh, from foreign to the domestic policy and different domestic reform issues in which i think is all for the better now uh, just the uh, i'm just towards the last is you know that uh, where i think uh, mr prime minister modi has made a very big difference is that uh, as i said he has linked foreign policy directly to india's economic interest and i believe and i know that all our indian missions are now in some sense under instruction that that's the principal objective of foreign policy and that gets reflected in the fact that despite all that's happening in india ups and downs the fdi has continued unabated and the india story sounds much more positive in foreign capitals than actually it does in mumbai and and and, and delhi etc etc so whenever i go abroad you know i mean i find that that's a, and that's his that's his big sort of achievement there um on and there is the third thing and uh, by the way i the, the strategic framework that i use very often is the three goals of national interest which is security economic prosperity and global public goods now in economic prosperity he has actually you know twist turned the foreign policy and that's his big change on security i am not sure whether he is uh, yet clear on whether it is how it will be achieved whether it's a, it's a tighter embrace Uh, with with the us uh, what he would do with the uh, he would do with the Ch china but what is clear is that he is for the first time been able to distinguish between these two interests security and economic prosperity as a result of which despite whatever is happening with china chinese investments and chinese exports continue in the country and so and that's that that's that very pragmatic distinction that has come about uh, with this mr modi in command and on global political goods you know the international solar alliance is an achieve, amazing achievement and therefore the presence of you know india's presence on global in a high table of global governance the claims have become uh, be, become stronger uh, last point uh, which is that uh, yeah, within economic prosperity his make uh, linking with the west is an amazing initiative you know where all, where he has he where he has shed all his uh, what people would have affected you know would have ex expected you know his bjp rss background etc and connected with the major muslim powers of the region you know saudi arabia dhabi or whatever when you look at and yet at the same time now going to israel so you know breaching that divide you, you know overcoming the divide in india's national interest because he knows that these are the countries who will be the biggest investors in india's infrastructure and his you know his, his conversation with abu dhabi sovereign fund etc are there as a testimony to all of that w just one final and because i mentioned nepal i i think he needs a fresh look on south asia because you know because he's been unable to uh, you know in some sense push uh, you know with bangladesh towards tista uh, pakistan is in a freeze nepal i think is way down uh, sri lanka is improved because of change in government in lanka but i think with myanmar and afghanistan also india could do much better so south asia the neighborhood policy Uh, requ requires to be reviewed at this point of time, and here I think uh, it will be far better you know, for Mr. Modi uh, to start acting much b more with the India's border states in dealing with their neighbours across the border, and develop their trust 
and then develop and make the Indian provinces also players in India's foreign policy. And I think that is waiting to be happen and not yet happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have one more question that I want to ask all of you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar actually partly answered it already, but I, I, I'm keen to hear the others as well, which is if we were to put a critical hat on, what would you say, I mean, I'll start with Sri I mean, I'll just raise a few issues that I think have been perhaps the most disappoint, disappointing aspects of uh, the last three years, um, partly because others have not mentioned it. I think one, Southeast Asia, I, I think while, while uh, India's relations with the West have been uh, exceeded expectations uh, over, over three years ago, I think Southeast Asia, there's a lot more work that can be done. Um, I think connecting the national security foreign policy apparatus to the line ministries has sometimes been an issue. Uh, but I mean, I'd be eager to hear particularly uh, Rajiv Kumar's views on, on this. Um, a third on global governance. I think one of the, at least uh, in the public domain, one of the things that was seen as a big setback was India's bid for the nuclear suppliers group. Um, where, and you know, the fact that it was not successful for a variety of reasons that we can get into um, was seen a, at least uh, domestically projected as, as, a, as a failure on, on, on the Prime Minister's part. And finally, on defense reforms. Um, which is if India is to project its power, there doesn't seem to be as much of an urgency on, 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 on defense reforms. But I'd, I'd be eager to hear uh, your view. Uh, so, Shriram, first, I mean, what, what do you think have been at least underwhelming or, 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 uh, in, in, in your estimation? Uh, yeah, Dhruva, I think you're um, quite accurate in saying that um, Southeast Asia, you see, S Southeast Asia used to be part of the, primarily the locus of our look east, what used to be called look east policy. And Modi has, in a way, gone further and f far beyond it by engaging Japan and um, South Korea in a much bigger way. Um, so Northeast Asia is now also part of the and Australia and the Pacific Island nations. If you take that whole cluster, that is our uh, ambit of our Act East. So Act East is much bigger than Look East. But um, Southeast Asia, yeah, I mean, I was disappointed. You know, I'm a, I mean, I wear my love for Modi on my sleeves. But what I'm saying is. I was disappointed with uh, the fact that he took two years, uh, more than two years for a summit with uh, Joko Widodo of Indonesia. I always believed that Jokowi and Modi can actually shape the regional architecture by coming together and coming up with a strategic plan to build up the spine of ASEAN in a way that it is not necessarily going to confront China because that's impossible because ASEAN has you know, is almost intertwined with China economically so much, but gives them more space and freedom to maneuver and uh, to also be able to withstand some of the um, struggles that the US and the China have in the region and to create an endogenous kind of a formation within uh, the Asian region, especially by leading independent minded um, middle to rising powers like, like India and, and uh, Indonesia. So I thought that that was a miss. Uh, they did, of course, eventually have the summit. I think it was in late 2016, in November or December. So it did happen. Uh, but I'd like to see more strategic uh, momentum there, especially with Indonesia. With the Philippines, well, I mean, I'm not going to go to you know, that maverick regime that's in place right now. But um, these two, as well as, of course, Vietnam, we are, we are uh, furthering the ties. So I think these are critical building blocks. But Indonesia was the key for me. And I would like to see more uh, momentum on that. Um, on defense, yes, uh, I'm not going to touch all four, but leave some more. On defense, yes, um, I think the spending uh, pattern has been disappointing. Um, the last I heard was uh, the latest budget, we are, we are still below 2% of GDP in defense outlays, 1.8% or something like that. So I think that's where um, I would have liked to see, you know, greater impetus. Um, but if you look at defense diplomacy, as in uh, engaging with other countries for joint exercises, uh, for projecting power, especially in the maritime commons, in the high seas, um, for engaging in, uh, for, for doing rescues, like the one they did in Yemen, um, that was huge. Um, we rescued the citizens of more than 45 countries. And this is something new, you know, um, that India's humanitarian uh, diplomacy using our military. Uh, General V.K. Singh was on the front lines. Prime Minister was directly speaking, I believe, uh, to the Saudi king to enable that thing. So those were remarkable. And um, increasingly, I think the defense, if you see the defense agreements, um, 
there's a very nice map made by the Mumbai based think tank Gateway House about the total number of defense agreements that have been signed in the last three years, including with East African countries, which is, as you know, is the further end of the western end of the Indian Ocean region. Uh, with Mozambique and these kind of countries, we have uh, furthered the uh, defense relationship uh, as part of our uh, commitment to be a net security provider. So yes, uh, our own indigenous capabilities and our defense, you know, manufacturing, our domestic, uh, you know, uh, ability to be um, self-sufficient and not to be reliant on imports um, of high-tech weaponry and all this remains. I mean, that I don't think uh, Modi can solve in a short uh, time. But make in India, the defense, you know, has to be our uh, flagship. So. Hopefully, there will be more momentum on that and we will be become more self-sufficient. But if you look at defense diplomacy as in the combination of foreign policy and military power projection, I think he has done better than uh, his predecessors. Vijay Ji, what, what would you say would be some of the things that you would have liked to have seen more? In A lot of things also depend on uh, the situation in the respective countries, but I would definitely see uh, India-China relations as one of the uh, major challenges in uh, days and months to come. Uh, as uh, Shriram has said, the uh, the trade is happening between India and China and it may even grow up, but uh, more or less hyphenation of China and Pakistan vis-a-vis -vis India, uh, that is something uh, we need to be uh, very carefully uh, watch. Uh, also, with the U.S., I think, uh, as everyone is predicting, the it will be more transactional uh, relationship than kind of a personal bond between uh, Mr. Barack Obama and Prime Minister Modi was there. And that will come up with uh, uh, new challenges and, of course, maybe new opportunities. Uh, and if you see the current ongoing visit of uh, President Trump, uh, to Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel uh, and then of course Rome uh, is some indication and I was very closely watching the Israeli newspapers before his visit and after that. Uh, Mr. Trump, uh, I guess out of seven, six out of seven public interactions uh, in Israel, he praised Saudi king. Uh, that is the statistic that has come. Uh, which shows a lot about his uh, interest in the transactional issues because they have apparently signed $350 billion of uh, trade deals between Israel and, uh, sorry, between Saudi and US, including $100 billion worth of defense deal. So, what I'm trying to tell you that all the traditional calculations uh, may not work in the new uh, regime in US and that is something which we need to be carefully watch. Uh, you mentioned Nepal. Um, there is an argument that has been made, and uh, be, uh, we can go beyond Nepal as well. Uh, but uh, you know, there's an argument made that India was not just not too harsh in its approach to Nepal, but in fact too soft, and and and, and perhaps that is why we have a continuing constitutional uh, and and political situation in Nepal. But I'd be eager to hear your thoughts on that. But but anything else that that may may not have been touched upon, as you think, it, were areas that were underwhelming. Uh, starting, uh, starting with Nepal, I think we've let the, uh, and we, I'll be blunt, we've, left, we've let the Madesi tail wag the Nepal dog, and I think that's a failure of our policy, uh, and we should, we should really look at it. And being harsh these days um, in a situation where you've got a buffer state, which has got their options, which we thought they didn't have, uh, is something which, you know, and with the train now coming from Lhasa to Kathmandu below the end of the Himalayas, I think we have to rethink or Nepal, um, and I can, I can elaborate it later on. Uh, so that's, w but but the, but the, but I think the um, we should be we should be honest to say that uh, you know we have allowed Pakistan to uh, to leverage its minimal equity far more than what it should have been able to do in the in the 1950s and 60s. We they, they I think they are, they have outsmarted us. They at that time became members of Cento and Seattle and got the U.S to work against us and now they not they don't mind becoming a client state of the Chinese and at the same time as, as, as Vijay said that hyphen that you've got we now have face a reality uh, that you've got the CEPC 
And uh, I, mean, I, I, I fear for the day when the Chinese PLA will say that our security of the corridor, uh, for the security of our corridor, we need to station our people there. And then what, what, what will be our response to that extent? So I think we, should, we could have, uh, if we had a smart, uh, smarter foreign policy, been able to anticipate this to a certain extent. And, and, and again, now we need to uh, do that. And I, and I think, therefore, also on, and again, as I said, with Bangladesh, and I, which, is, which is my last remark, uh, foreign policy requires coalition building with your own chief ministers. You know, and therefore, you need to work you know, with, the, with, the neighbor, you know, with the border states and give them greater confidence of being able to deal with the states across the border, because India can handle that. Uh, the other thing that I, I, I find is that um, um, on the um, uh, one, uh, you know, let me just put it this way that I, mean, I, I, I respect the book, but, but at the government, uh, it's time that the Indian government come, uh, comes out with a white paper on its foreign policy. I mean, the articulation of the strategic interests, you know, I would have thought, because otherwise the sort of feeling remains that it is business as usual with some incremental changes here and there. And I think this is the time, this is something that one could have expected of this regime if, 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 as you go forward, an intellectual uh, sort of articulation of it. Uh, Russia, I think, is something that we uh, need to think through as to what's happening there because it's been our all-weather partner for a very long time. We've allowed those relations uh, to, uh, to go. And um, there's two other points, which is that uh, we, wherever we tend to get interministerial issues, uh, we seem to be falling between the stools. Uh, and, the, and the example I want to give to is the, is the B2B relations with, with the U.S. You know, our G2G and our P2P are very good, but we know that the U.S. foreign policy is driven by its business interests much more than anything else. And that IP regime and the pharma call, pharmacy, pharmacies and the other thing remain uh, you know, on the stove. And the B2B relationship can be improve that uh, because this administration is going to be far more transactional than anything else going forward. And then the last one uh, is, uh, uh, the very last one is that uh, um, the, lack of, uh, the lack of an extra effort on SARC and at the same time the willingness to be members of every formation that comes our way. And I, for example, and the only example that I want to give, and I don't yet understand why should we be the members of SCO, for example, uh, given our relations with China and Russia. Uh, but you know, we've chosen to be that. So I don't, I, I'm not, I would like to know as to what is a multi regional relationship uh, that India has said we will avoid. Uh, and just one other thing that I need to add is that, give it, taking the example of RCEP, uh, you know, the regional, uh, there, is a, there is a danger here that we may be, we may be succumbing to internal protectionist pressures and therefore denying some of our uh, advantages that you get uh, with the, with the you know, economic, you know, comprehensive economic uh, partnerships, et cetera, and moving back away in some sense from the, even moving back away from uh, some of the bilateral or multilateral, uh, essentially bilateral pacts that we have signed. And uh, that's the economic part of the foreign policy that I would like to see much more active and, 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 and be rethought. Uh, I have one final question to uh, Vijayji uh, before opening it up because I'm keen to get uh, responses from the floor. Um, clearly, Prime Minister Modi has a strong political mandate which he in, from 2014 and it's been reinforced by a series of state level elections. Uh, he clearly d finds a link between the domestic, his domestic agenda and foreign policy. He brings an energy to, uh, to his international travel, his international engagements that, that I think is quite uh, admirable. Um, and he seems to have a sort of instinct for international power in a way. How much of this, of the last three years, have we seen a Modi foreign policy versus a BJP foreign policy? In, or another way of looking at it is, uh, if you had a different leader of the BJP instead of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, would things look very different? I think it's a tough question because uh, part of it is hypothetical. Uh, I cannot see any other leader uh, replacing within the party also replacing uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, in times to come. Uh, I And I agreed partially that uh, Prime Minister's own uh, personality has a great influence 
uh, on uh, the foreign policy but also there is uh, our own lineage and thought process uh, and uh, we talked a lot about foreign policy and uh, coming out of ideology but to tell you a little historical context uh, it we always have said that this is a foreign policy and not foreign principle that means it is flexible and that is not Vijay Chauthayale, some junior person in party is saying, but our great ideologue of party, Mr. Dindyal Upad has written this in 50s. So we are not dogmatic as a party, even though everything which BJP or government does is seen in the ideological mirror, uh, which is okay to an extent, but uh, definitely not uh, that uh, stringent as far as the foreign policy, that is number one. Uh, the second part is, for example, our uh, uh, views on Israel or even our relationship with U.S. Uh, we always had a good relationship with U.S. with some ups and downs, but we somehow previous regimes were some hesitant to talk about it because something to talk, uh, being a very good with the capitalist uh, capital of the world is uh, something uh, against our socialistic instinct. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister Modi has overcome that inhibition. Uh, we overcome, we deprioritize NAM to an extent, uh, to a great extent in fact, uh, and that is something uh, we adapted to the changing circumstances. And uh, upcoming visit with Israel, we always had a very good defense cooperation and military cooperation with Israel for last at least since Nasir Rao regime. Uh, and we didn't talk about it. We were always shy about talking about it. And uh, after a real Sharon's visit, no Indian Prime Minister went there. Uh, that also is a fact. But now we are coming open. We are saying that, yes, uh, it's not important, not only about our defense cooperation, but also with the business to business, people to people uh, relationship with Israel is as important. And you will see it in the f next weeks, a few weeks to come. So I think these are something very distinct to BJP's line of thinking in addition to uh, Prime Minister Modi's own persona. So it's a combination of both. Thank you very much.